name is Ted Forsyth. I want to walk you all to tonight's program. Remove the cloak of secrecy, police. Transparency, transparency now. Thank you. Yeah, remove the cloak of secrecy, police. Transparency now. Um, I am a member of Enough is Enough. Um, and I just wanted to uh, thank you again for all coming out tonight. Um, and I want to thank our sponsors tonight. Um, a Rochester Coalition for Police Reform, United Christian Leadership Ministry, Metro Justice, the Flying Squirrel Community Space, Take Back the Land Rochester, Citizen Action in New York, the New York Civil Liberties Union, Basing Race, Embracing Equity, and the Downtown Presbyterian Church Justice Team. I also wanted to take a second and introduce our coordinating group tonight. Uh, Shirley Stooks is in the back. She is working heavily with the fruits. Thank you, Shirley. And Barbara Lackaware over here, sitting in front, um, have been vital to the effort to bring Bob here tonight. Thank you. Okay. Jeremy Coleman. Oh, Jeremy Coleman. Where is? Oh, there he is. Oh, right front. Yeah. <laughs> Jeremy, uh, I think you made contact with Bob first, and yes. opened up a whole new world of like accountability possibility. Yeah. I, I hope so. Yeah. Great. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about. Um, why abolishing 50A is really important for Enough is Enough and the Rochester area. Um, number one, uh, Enough is Enough is working on a police misconduct database. This database is comprised of uh, news releases, pre uh, articles, and uh, anecdotes from individuals who have given us consent to put those stories in a database. Um, <clears throat> so far, we've identified 45 officers who have committed violence against civilians, including brutality, shootings, and murder. Uh, nine of those officers are repeat offenders. And that's just what we know based on the media and based on people that come to us. So there's like 750 police officers in the department, and 50A prevents us from going to our public officials, our city government, and asking for personnel records, reprimands, disciplinary records, these things that would give us a sense of the extent of the violence in our police department. We are prevented from doing that because of 50A. Uh, secondly, uh, we've been working on um, sort of exposing the civilian review board that we have in Rochester as a failed system for the people of the city. Um, only 2% of unnecessary force complaints were sustained by the chief who has the final say in all complaints, over 14 years of complaints. Only 2%. It's a very minor fraction of total complaints. Um, also, over a 12-year period, for which we have the data, um, the harshest discipline the police department can muster for cases of unnecessary use of force that were sustained was four officers getting two months of suspension each. That's it. 12 years, that's the harshest they could do. What does it pay? What's that? What does it pay? I presume so. But they were off, they were off duty. Um, the, the issue, aside from the fact that this is a structure that has failed the people of Rochester for, for 23 years, is that 58 prevents the board from actually getting the same thing, the personnel files, the disciplinary records, lawsuits against the officers that have come before them, so they are unable to see the patterns and practices of the same officers. So 50A is like above and beyond regular FOIL, Freedom of Information Law uh, protections. It has been broadened immensely to basically exclude uh, any, any um, public inquiry into police uh, personnel files. So the board, which is constituted by the city, cannot even see the patterns and practices because they are not allowed by this law. They don't have to disclose that information. Um, which leads me to the last point about uh, being here tonight. Um, enough is enough is not holding this meeting for just informational interests or just to sort of get the word out about this. Our goal is to abolish this law. I want to be very clear about that. Everyone in this room is here because this is of interest of some capacity to you. For our organization, Enough is Enough, we want to abolish this law. This would give us access to these records that are currently being withheld by cities, by municipalities, by police departments across the state. Think about Eric Garner, who was choked to death. 
And right now there's a case pending because the Legal Aid Society of New York City wants his, his records. And because of 58, the city is denying that. And so there's an appeal process going on right now. But um, that all said, I just wanted to be clear about what enough is enough's purpose here. And we, will hope, we hope that you will join us in this statewide struggle to abolish this law. Thank you. Barbara Life. I just want to say thank you to Bob for coming here. Um, we didn't know much about 50A until a few months ago, and he, he somehow, Jeremy, when the, uh, when the whole body camera, we were pursuing the body camera issue, and we were trying to get people to get on board with having body cameras for the police, suddenly we realized, I remember Jeremy came into a meeting one night and said, it doesn't matter if we have body cameras if we can't access the footage. And that's when we made the connection. Jeremy called Bob. Bob spent 45 minutes on the phone on a conference call with us, not knowing who we were, this little group from Rochester. And then he agreed to come. And I just, he's, uh, I just met him for the first time tonight, but we've had numerous emails and phone calls. And um, he gave, gave me his bio. He's, he's won a lot of awards, and I'm not going to bore you with that, because I think the thing that means the most to me is that I think that he's probably one of the premier people in this country about freedom of information and making uh, government open and has worked, you know, his, basically his entire career on that front and um, he's willing to just, you know, say, sure, I'll come to Rochester and, and uh, I'll talk to you guys on the phone and so uh, just glad to have Bob here and at some point I'm going to be passing around a sign-up sheet because I know you're all going to want to keep involved in this and we're going to have a strategy session the next two Tuesdays at 7 o'clock uh, at the Flying Squirrel and where enough is enough meets. So thank you, Bob Freeman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for being here, and especially Jeremy and Barbara Wacker uh, Ware and uh, Lacker Ware uh, for bringing us together. I I'm just kind of surprised that um, all of you are not home watching the uh, Republican debate. <laughs> <laughs> no? Had enough. No. Had enough. Already? Already. Already. What um, debate? Um, I want to give you Trump just a, <laughs> I want to give you a little bit more background. Uh, I work for the New York State Department of State. I am a government employee. Um, our unit is called the Committee on Open Government. It is a tiny state agency. The staff is two of us at full strength, soon to be three. We are the smallest state agency that actually does anything. I will leave the rest of your imagination. And I have what I've considered forever, and I do mean that, to be the best job in state government. Um, when I say forever, um, I think I hold the record, I'm pretty sure that I hold the record, for having the same telephone number for the longest time of any appointee in the executive branch. I've had the same phone number since uh, 1974. Uh, which means that either, either it's a pretty good job or I'm the biggest rut ever created. I'd like to think that it's the former. And why is it a great job? All we do all day, every day, is offer advice, legal advice, either verbally or by means of written opinions, to anybody who has a question about what's public and what's not in terms of government information in New York. Primarily in relation to two laws, our freedom of information law, many of you know it as FOIL, and the open meetings law. And when I suggest to you that we give advice to anybody, I mean exactly that. We take lots of inquiries from people like you, members of the public, people from local government, state government, members of the news media. It doesn't matter. Our only goal is to give what we believe to be the right answer under the law, irrespective of the source of the question. So we are not there to support the government. We're there to do the right thing. And I'm not suggesting that that is always mutually exclusive. Um, but um, in any case, anybody can call. Um, we always return the call. It may not be instantly, but we do what we can to get back to people as quickly as possible. I should mention to you that we have a website. It's really easy to find. Simply Google COOG for Committee on Open Government. And we have a ton of material that's available online. Uh, we have the text of the laws, frequently asked questions. There's a news column that describes developments in legislation as well as judicial precedent. Um, most important for so many people, 
I mentioned that we write advisory opinions, and I'm not going to mislead. They are just that. If you read an opinion, you don't like it, you can throw it away and say, Freeman doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. That is your choice. That's your choice. The hope, of course, is that the opinions are educational, persuasive, that they encourage compliance with law as well as knowledge of the law. And for what it's worth, where the courts have reviewed our opinions, they've agreed probably about 85% of the time. So the track record is pretty good. Um, we've written in the neighborhood, and this will sound ridiculous, of 25,000 advisory opinions. They are indexed by subject matter. So if you have a question about police officers' personnel records, you would go to our alphabetical index, click on P, scroll down to police officers' personnel records, and the opinions that have any sort of precedential value that has been prepared since 1993 are available online in full text. So there's a wealth of information that is there at your fingertips. Um, before taking your questions, and I expect that you will all have questions and comments, I hope so, I want to give you just a touch of background. The Freedom of Information Law applies to all government agencies in New York. State agencies, county, cities, towns, villages, school districts, public authorities, they're all covered by FOIL. And FOIL deals with all government agency records. One of the distinguishing features of our law, as opposed to other access laws around the country, is that our law has defined what a government agency record is since 1978. And when we were drafting the essence of the current version of the law in the late 70s, we tried to correct what we believe to be the deficiencies in the Federal Freedom of Information Act, which applies only to federal agencies. Um, one of those deficiencies, which exists to this day, involves the absence of a definition of what a federal agency record might be. Um, to this day, there are issues that percolate through the federal courts, which involve who prepared it, where did it come from, what is its function. Those issues were all resolved here by 1978. Um, think about, think about the 70s. Do you think about the 70s? Do you think about the 70s? No. <laughs> High tech. <laughs> High tech was an electric typewriter. We used carbon paper to make copies. College kids don't know what the hell carbon paper is. Um, there was no such thing as the internet. There was no email. But it was the beginning of the era of computers. And again, since that time, our law has been expansive by means of the definition of the term record. A record is defined to mean any information in any physical form whatsoever, kept, held, filed, produced, or reproduced by, with, or for a government agency. So it might be the eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper, it might be the content of videotape, it might be a database, it might be email, all of those things that store information and are maintained by or for the government are government agency records that fall within the coverage of FOIA. From there, the next question is, what's public and what's not? And as a general rule, FOIL is based primarily, in my opinion, on common sense. All it generally says is that all government agency records are accessible except those records or portions of records that fall within a series of exceptions. Most of the exceptions relate to the possibility of harm should the government be required to disclose. Just to give you some background regarding this particular issue, one of the exceptions in FOIL deals with the ability of the government to withhold when disclosure would result in an unwarranted invasion of personal privacy. That's the phrase in the law. That's typical in the United States. You see the same language in the Federal Act, unwarranted invasion of personal privacy. I always ask the crowd, anybody know what that means? Unwarranted, unwarranted invasion of personal privacy. Nobody knows what it means. Nobody will ever know what it means. <laughs> there isn't a judge alive who's in a better position than any of you, assuming that you're reasonable people, to make judgments about privacy. And the reality is that as a society, our views about privacy are constantly changing. I offer an example these days that has nothing to do with FOIL. Anybody here ever see the uh, Victoria's Secrets ads on the tube? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, some people here probably take them. Um, <laughs> my question is, would those ads have run on network TV 20 years ago? No, probably not. Well, gee, why are they running today? Because the sensibilities of society have changed. They've changed. Um, 
about this? Anybody here have uh, kids? What is this Facebook thing anyway? Yeah, <laughs> you know? Yes. I'm taking this out so I can mosey around the room. Is that better? Oh, 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 oh. Barbara, oh, no. Oh, She's super woman. Amazing. Wow. All right, we'll use the mic instead. Um, our kids have a completely different view of privacy than their parents. Uh, our kids share information about themselves that their parents would never be willing to share. They have a different idea. Uh, how about this? Two equally reasonable people can look at the same items and disagree. I use my own life as an example all the time. Um, we used to have a joke in the house. If the phone rang after 9 o'clock, it was either my mother-in-law mm. or a reporter who got kicked out of the meeting, who wanted to know whether the meeting was was, was validly closed under the open meetings law. People just call a lot. Mostly at work, but sometimes at night, at home, on the weekends, it doesn't bother me. It's the deal, it's part of my job. My name, my home address, my home phone number, part of the phone book, anybody can get them. They're available now on the white pages online. Anybody can get them. Let's do that again. <laughs> my wife, on the other hand, uses a different name. She never put that name in the phone book with a home address and a home phone number. Why? Two reasons. Number one, pretty, uh, pretty painfully obvious. She doesn't want to be associated with me. I can. It's <laughs> not that fun. <laughs> <laughs> Second, she's a psychotherapist. She doesn't want to call. She's calling her at home on her phone number, knowing where she lives, knowing that she's married to me, knowing that at certain times of our lives it is seen that we just have too many kids. She has perfectly good and valid reasons for saying no, never. I have equally valid reasons for saying, okay, and never the twain shall meet. So what do we do about privacy? Well, the state's highest court has grappled with the issue, and the Court of Appeals, as records pertain to ordinary people, has said very simply, react from the gut. What would the reasonable person of ordinary sensibilities feel about disclosure of this item? Is it one of those things where the average person would say, wait, wait a minute, this is nobody's business, this is intimate, it's highly personal. If that's your conclusion, chances are pretty good that the government has the authority to say no. The other branch of case law is what we're really focusing on. It involves the privacy of people like me, public employees. Anybody else here a public employee, government employee? One, where do you work? Board You're a school board member here in the city of Rochester? I've talked to you a lot before I joined the board. Yeah, that, <laughs> you know, I've spoken to half the people in the state at least once, so I'm fairly convinced of that. <laughs> Earlier today, I was on the road this morning at 6.15 to do a program in Cattaraugus County. Can you dig it? How many of you have been in Cattaraugus County? That's where I used to live. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. Cattaraugus County, Little Valley, wow. I mean, you know. And, and, and that was a, it was sponsored by the, uh, the uh, Cattaraugus County Association of Town Clerks. There were 80 people there, primarily, I think, because Cattaraugus County does not get a lot of attention from state government employees. So, um, so they, they came and, you know, I was there for three hours. Um, so it was a great program, it was a great program. But in any case, as a public employee, as a public employee, in general, the courts have found that people like me, we public employees, pops, public officers, public officers, public officers, was that you? No, just <laughs> uh, We have less privacy than anybody else. Why? We're supposed to be more accountable than anybody else. The public, in so many instances, is stuck with us until the next election, until budget cuts, in my case, until retirement or death, whichever comes first. I've been eligible for both for years. Um, yeah, it's true. Um, second, more importantly, in so many instances, the courts have said frequently that those items about public employees that in some way relate to their duties are public. Why? Because disclosure of those circumstances would result in a permissible, not an unwarranted invasion of privacy. You want to know my salary or the salary of any public employee in the state? It's public. You want to know when I come to work and when I don't? It's public. If I've done something wrong on the job, 
and there has been either a finding of misconduct or an admission of misconduct. The record that contains that information is public. It is public, and that's true with respect to people like me, to teachers, to secretaries, to sanitation workers, to the great majority of public employees, but not police officers, but not police officers. And I want to give you just a touch of history. FOIL went into effect in 1974. And one of the first cases involved a request for reprimands issued to three police officers in Johnson City, New York, near Binghamton. And the court, I think, appropriately held that they're public. <coughs> well, uh, under the dark of night, the state legislature passed Section 50A of the Civil Rights Law. 50A of the Civil Rights Law. And it says, it says that those personnel records pertaining to police officers that are used to evaluate performance toward continued employment or promotion are confidential. They cannot be disclosed. So if I've done something wrong on the job, you have the right to know. But if a police officer has done something wrong on the job, you do not. You do not. And sadly, as was pointed out in the introductory remarks, there are numerous judicial decisions which have, to my mind, expanded the scope of confidentiality beyond what was initially intended by the state legislature. The goal of the state legislature, at least as expressed in the statement of intent, and I think it's, I think it's malarkey. I think it's malarkey, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Malarkey is a technical legal term. <laughs> um, the idea was to prevent disclosure of embarrassing or vexatious, that was the term that was used, vexatious <laughs> items concerning police officers when police officers were called to testify, when they were called to the stand. Um, they didn't want disclosure of the fact that so-and-so had you know, 22 reprimands that were unrelated to whatever the proceeding might have been. But, how many of you have ever seen uh, cop shows on TV? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Has anybody ever said, what, I object? And the judge says, this is not relevant, it doesn't come in. The whole presumption of 50A is misplaced. It is based upon the assumption that the judge has no control over the courtroom, that there will never be an objection to disclosure of something that is irrelevant, irrelevant. So 50A, as I said, to my mind, is based upon a selling job to the state legislature. And let's face it, who has a tremendous amount of influence? I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about police unions, yeah. I'm talking about police unions. And police unions pushed it through. Police unions have fought, have fought against efforts to disclose. They have fought situations in which the government wanted to disclose. Let me give you an example, the key case, one of the first key cases. Anybody here, um, anybody here um, ever hear of this? The infamous egg throwing incident in Schenectady? No. I'm going to tell you about it. The Schenectady cop was about to get married, had a bachelor party, invited all of his friends, knew that they were going to get drunk, hired a bus. That was great. They didn't drive drunk, but they threw eggs at people. They threw eggs at people. And there were 18, 18 Schenectady police officers who were reprimanded. And you know, and it's not a big city. People wanted to know was my cop one of the ones who was reprimanded? And, um, the city wanted to disclose, and the union sued to prevent disclosure. The case went to the Court of Appeals, the state's highest court. The court looked at 50A, the civil rights law, and said pretty much, we have no choice. We have no choice. It says what it says. If the record is to be used to evaluate performance toward continued employment or promotion, sorry, it's out of bounds. It's out of bounds. Um, and that was the beginning, at least in my opinion, of the end of, let's say, reasonable interpretations of law, dealing with the accountability of police officers. Um, in fact, Schenectady, like Rochester, Schenectady at the time was involved in consideration of a civilian complaint review board, the Zuntai. And I was asked to do a program there, and one of, the, one of the attendees was the president of the police union. And he said to me, you know, nobody trusts us because, you know, because of these reprimands. And, and I said, gee, wouldn't you be better off if the public knew who the 18 were? 
through disclosure of the names of the 18, you know, the public would know that all of the other police officers had nothing to do with that incident, that they were not involved in misconduct. He said, yeah, that would be great. And I said, then why don't you push for the repeal of Section 58? Oh, no, can't do that. Can't do that. Can't do that. And that is the knee-jerk reaction when it comes to efforts to do something to limit the application of 58. Um, in my heart of hearts, and uh, I don't know if you're interested, but on our website is our annual report. And uh, it was issued in December, and the report calls for the repeal of 50A, the they, civil rights law. They have it on their chart. You do? Okay, well that's good. Um, yeah? Um, is this why officers feel, not all, but some officers feel they are above the law? Wow, because that's not a question that I can answer, but, <laughs> but, but you know, you but know, from, you know based upon what you read, what you hear, what, you know, incidents that we've seen all over the country where it is crystal clear, and I'm not saying that all police officers engage in, let's say, unnecessary force, but some do. Some do. Um, my belief is that some police officers become police officers because they can do that. Not all, most, I think, do their jobs exceedingly well. Exceedingly well. But what do we read about? What is the nature of news? The nature of news is bad news. The nature of news is the aberration, right? I had to tell my kids years ago, you know, if there's no accident on the throughway, you're not gonna read about it. But if there is, maybe you will. Maybe you will. And the chances are pretty good that most days you don't hear anything about something akin to brutality on the part of a police officer because it doesn't happen frequently. But when it does, we do hear about it. And it is the aberration. Yes? Um, do other states have such a law like 50A? And who else does it really, besides police officers, who else does it protect? And finally, if we can't see the footage because it may have an impact on the evaluation of a police officer. What the hell is it? Is it? Yeah. Who reviews it? Yeah, anyway? well, um, first of all, in terms of the other states, no state, to the best of our knowledge, has enacted a provision that provides the degree of confidentiality as New York. Um, most states treat police officers' personnel records in much the same way as they treat the personnel records of other government employees. Now, that is not to suggest that a great deal is available. Generally speaking, New York is pretty expansive in its uh, interpretation of FOIA. Again, the exception involves 50A simply because that statute is there. Number two, number two, what about the body cams? What about the body cams? Who watches them? Who watches them? Um, so far, to the best of my knowledge, there are relatively few police departments. Oh, I, I didn't answer your second question. Who else is covered by 50A? It's the slippery slope. A few years after 50A applied to police officers, it was amended to apply to correction officers. Then it was expanded to apply to uniformed firefighters, professional firefighters. Those people don't take the stand. What the heck? What, you know, it's again, it's because I'm not anti-union. Generally speaking, I've been pro-union my whole life. But, but they have a hell of a lot of clout and they give lots of money to lots of legislators. Yes. I'm Cheryl Cates Gunner, so it's a pleasure to meet you. Hello, Cheryl Cates. How are you? Exchange correspondence throughout the year. Periodically. Yes. So, do you think that just the abolishment of 50A is going to solve the problem? Because what, don't you think the police will just use the investigative exemption under public officers' law, like the joint docs at the Department of Corrections, if you abolish this law? No, I think it'll make a huge difference. It'll make a huge difference because. Cheryl is referring to an exception in FOIL that deals with records compiled for law enforcement purposes. And those kinds of records can be withheld insofar as disclosure would interfere with a law enforcement investigation or judicial proceeding, deprive somebody of a right to a fair trial, identify a confidential source, or reveal other than routine criminal investigative techniques and procedures. Obviously, not every record that deals with the conduct of a police officer falls within the scope of that exception. Now, what we have tried to do is seek the repeal of 58 or, or narrowing the scope of that provision to deal with those records that are created <coughs> and used solely, solely for the purpose of evaluating performance. Um, that would mean that um, in Rochester, there was a case decided years ago involving so-called use of force reports, use of force reports, 
Now they're prepared for multiple purposes. They were found to be confidential under 50A of the Civil Rights Law. Now, if the suggestion that I just offered became law, 50A would not apply. 50A would not apply. We would have greater rights of access, certainly, than we have now. There was another question. Yeah. Would, would this uh, apply to, say, a video that was taken in a school where um, a lot of officers are stationed here in Rochester? But what are they doing? <laughs> what are they doing? I mean, you know, the question is, is and, and why is why is the video there? Why is the video used in the school? They have body cameras. Well, I'm not talking about body cameras. Body I'm talking about other things. You know, school, schools have now, they often have, have uh, surveillance cameras, hidden cameras. Um, and that's one of the situations where our suggestion has been that if, if indeed it is a hidden camera, you don't want to disclose its location. You don't want to disclose what it is captured on tape. Why? Because as kids find out, they'll go smoke weed someplace else, right? Right, that's the reality of it. That's the reality of it. So there are exceptions that, that might apply, but, but arguably, if that footage is in a school and it captures whatever it might be that involves a police officer, the argument might be, well, yeah, this is a personnel record that's used to evaluate performance, can't have it. That is my fear with respect to body cam footage. Now, for what it's worth, why has there been so much discussion about body cams? One of the reasons, I think, is that so many people have phones. So many people have phones. And you know, if the body cam doesn't capture what it, whatever the event might be, your phone might. Your phone might. And what do we see? What do we see too often? What do we see? Yeah, injustice. 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 Um, my fear, my fear is that uh, if the law stands as it is, the body cam footage will be viewed by many police departments as being exempt from disclosure in its entirety because it is used to evaluate performance. That would defeat the purpose of the body cam, in my opinion. Part of the purpose of the body cam, in my opinion, for obvious reasons, involves the enhancement of accountability. The enhancement of accountability. So that if you are captured on tape, if you're captured on tape, number one, you can't invade your own privacy, can you? No, you can't. I might not be able to get it, she might not be able to get it, but you can't invade your own privacy. But would it be confidential if the argument is, well, gee, this was used to evaluate the performance of the cop? Maybe, maybe, I hope not, I hope not, but I know damn well that lots of police departments across the state Particularly the big ones, particularly the big ones, state police, New York City Police Department, they will contend that just about everything is covered by 58. And getting anything out of them now is, 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 is exceedingly difficult. Yes? So is this why some of the agencies are willing now to go, okay, well, we'll, 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 we'll do body cameras because they know this law? Is I can't happen. tell you. I don't know the answer. I don't know the answer. Maybe, maybe they do things differently. Maybe they view it as a means of improving decorum, if you will. Improving, <coughs> improving the performance of their own officers, improving the reactions of members of the public. Let's face it, if you run into a cop and you know that you're on tape, you're gonna be nice, right? You're not gonna do anything stupid, are you? No, nor is the cop, nor is the cop. Um, but there will be occasions when all of us do stupid things. And it will be captured, and, and there, are, there are a zillion questions that come up. Um, what if there are 100 police officers in the city of Rochester, and they wear the body cams uh, five hours a day, and uh, along comes the DNC and says, uh, we'd like to see all the video for the past month. Holy <coughs> smoke, who's gonna, re who's gonna review it? How long will it take? How much will it cost? What about the cost of storage? What about the cost of redaction? There are a zillion issues that arise, and none of them, so far, at least in my opinion, have been answered with any degree of, let's call it satisfaction, for lack of a better word. Um, there was a bill that was introduced relatively recently after the legislature left town, but uh, it has been introduced, which would remove body cam footage from the scope of 50A and bring it within the coverage of the Freedom of Information Law. Now again, that would not mean that the footage necessarily would be public. Some aspects of it would be public, as in any other case involving FOIL. 
we look at the content, we consider the effects of disclosure, and from there, we determine what's public and what's not. Um, again, there are some items that would justifiably be withheld based upon considerations of personal privacy. There are other situations where disclosure is likely to interfere with an investigation. Disclosure might identify a witness to a crime and place that person in jeopardy if it were to be disclosed. But there are other cases where it would be innocuous, where a police officer would run into any one of us walking down the street and uh, say, um, you know, how are you today? Where are you headed? What are you doing? Um, it seems to me that that ordinarily, at the very least, should be available to the person who was the subject of that little exchange. There will be other situations where it should be public, where the body cam captures a motor vehicle accident at the corner of, of uh, it's you and uh, whatever the cross street is. I don't know. Uh, yeah. Um, why would that not be disclosed? Why would that not be disclosed? It would be innocuous and it would be public. Um, the point is, the point is that that I think that the use of the body cam opens a whole slew of Pandora's boxes, and I don't believe that most people have engaged in what I have come to call the Aretha Franklin principle of law. Tell me what that is. Someone. Are we SBAs? No, that's not it. That's what everybody says. No. How many of you have seen the Blues Brothers movie? Come on, everybody's seen it, right? Best scene in the movie? Think. You better think. You better think. Oh. They haven't thought it through. They have not thought it through. Often Congress doesn't think it through. You know, after 9-11, we saw the passage of the Patriot Act and the Homeland Security Act. Dumb, 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 dumb. We saw states around this country pass laws that said things like, no map that indicates the location of a water supply is public. I can see the Hudson River from my office. <laughs> and somehow, you know, the reservoir, reservoir is always next to Reservoir Road. You know, they didn't, they didn't think it through. They didn't think it through. And too often, we all pay. We all pay until the light bulb goes on. And they say, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe we didn't think it through to the extent that we should have. Yes. So with uh, 50A, in your experience, when you see it being used by these uh, various agencies, uh, are, do some agencies always use it in every instance? Are there some that are selective? Like, uh, like maybe we'll release information if it exonerates our officer and all other times it's up, where there are agencies where it's always automatically in use all the time? What's in your experience? Agencies, it's pretty automatic. In but, others, or, or, and also, are there in, some agencies that like maybe never uh, uh, hide behind? You know, never is a term that I don't like to use. I don't like to use always either, because yeah. they're both wrong, usually. Um, no, there are some that are more, let's say, receptive than others. My personal, my personal belief is that ordinarily, as the unit of government diminishes in size, the more accountable is the government. Why? Why? Because there's proximity. There's proximity. You know, you're on the school board here in Rochester. Um, I know school board members in my town. The town supervisor walks down the street. People know who he is. Member of the assembly walks down the street? Mm, maybe not. Lieutenant governor? Who the heck is that? Um, you know, and I'm not trying to demean Kathy Hobel, but the reality is that most people don't know her. Most people don't know her. Um, some of you know Louise Slaughter, I bet. Yeah, I knew Louise before she was in Congress. Um, she and I both worked for that other Cuomo, Mario. <laughs> who, who, um, how do I put this nicely? Sometimes the apple does fall from the tree. But we'll just leave, we'll just leave that one alone. We'll leave that one alone. Um, more thoughts, more questions? Yeah. What was the date of this uh, dark of the night decision? It's 19, well, the decision was 1976. The law was amended, I believe, in 70, at the end of 76, when it was effect in 77. Oh. So, um, I get the, the sense that it's kind of a, a confusing prospect to try to explain to people how uh, you know access rights work. When we, you know, if we go out and try to engage people up on on this subject, I mean, how do you recommend that we can express to them how how this is being used and how um, how it's really. A specific, a specific aspect just to, just to police. I think I mean, you start off with the notion that uh, by law, we have a general right to know what the government is doing. What is the government up to? Um, we have the right to know how well or poorly public employees 
carry out their duties. Um, and again, I use the example of the great majority of public employees. Mm -hmm. You know, if I do something great and there's a record that indicates that, it's public. If I do something terrible and there's a record that indicates that, that's public. And the same is true for teachers, sanitation workers, secretaries, administrative assistants, judges. But why? Why not police officers? Why not police officers? And again, realistically, they are the people who have the most power over our lives. Why should they be the least accountable? Right. And, uh, to me, that I, I think just that, that gut sense is helpful. Like when you're talking about the, the judges and how they come up with the idea of a, um, a gut sense on what should be private, it, it seems like it's the same thing. Right? You know, and the judges too, I, I, you know, I, I, was, I was pretty upset uh, regarding a, a decision by an appellate court judge with whom I went to law school. Um, you know, when you're in law school, you're poor. We wash dishes in a bathtub together. And um, the issue involved personnel records concerning a police officer who had retired, who was no longer a cop. How could that records could be used to evaluate performance toward continued employment or promotion? And yet, the appellate division said, yep, continues to apply even after so-and-so is retired. Because they never use it, they never alleviate that exclusive clause. That's an exclusive clause. Okay? It's an awful clause. That's why I want to see it repealed. Repealed. That's why we need it to be repealed. There's a cop who died. He was in an accident. He was drunk. Request was made for the records involving his performance. No, nope, can't have him. 58. 58. 58. Can't have him. Can't have him. There was a case that went to the Court of Appeals, which involved Albany police officers who illegally purchased firearms. You know, they were, they were, they were acquired by whoever it was, the federal government or something like that, and then, then you know, they, they bought them. They bought them. And the issue involved access to gun tags. They were essentially the receipts, a receipt for the purchase of a firearm. How could it be that that could be characterized as a personnel record? Huh. The Albany Times Union had to go all the way to the Court of Appeals. And they were fought tooth and nail the entirety of the case. Crazy. It's crazy. It's crazy. It's lunacy, yes. Ms. Yeah. Juror. What? Yeah, Ms. Oh, Juror. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm just wondering if some of this is because basically the police um, work for the wealthiest people. In this state and in the world. I don't think that that's the basis of it. I really don't. I really don't. You know, maybe there's some element of truth behind that. I don't. Excuse me. What was the question? The question was: Do you think? Do I think that, that the basis of this is the fact, the fact that police officers work for the wealthiest people in this country and in the world? I don't think that that's true. I don't think that that's true. Um, I think because, in all honesty. You know, there is sort of a fraternity among police officers. Mm -hmm. And you've heard of the uh, blue wall of silence? Yeah. yeah, well, it's real. It's real. It's real. And the reality is that um, they tend to protect each other, which is completely understandable. But I think that they protect each other in a way that is inconsistent with the way virtually all other public employees are treated. Yeah. What do you think about the, you said that there was a bill that was introduced. Yeah. Um, I guess it's already been introduced this year about the body cam footage. Yes. So would it be strategically easier to support a bill like that or just really go all out and try and repeal it? Like I'm just trying to think of what would be the best way to. I, 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 don't, I don't know. I don't know. Um, you know, there was an editorial in the New York Times calling for the repeal of 58 civil rights law. Some people actually re read the New York Times. Some people read the Times. Um, one of them happened to have been uh, a member of the assembly who is now the chair of the Minority Caucus. Um, he's from Queens, and his staff person called and said, you know, my boss is really interested in this. And um, I said, that would be great, it would be great in my view, to bring this issue before the Black and Hispanic Caucus, um, because if there was ever a time for consideration of legislation of this nature, this was the time. And in fact, in fact, I thought that this past year was the year 
you know, we, we our, our annual report came out in December, and you had the events of Ferguson, you had Eric Garner, you have a whole slew of, of issues. And my hope, my belief was that there would be some legislators, particularly African American, Latino, whatever, who would say, now is the time. If there was ever a time, this is the time. And nothing happened. Nobody did anything. I even spoke, you know, I was asked to, um, to address the Assembly Committee on Government Operations, which deals with freedom of information, among other issues. The chair is Crystal People Stokes. I don't know if you know who she is. She, she is an Assembly member from Buffalo. And um, uh, there, as a member of the committee, was a new member. Um, a black, a black woman from Brooklyn, she came up to me and she said, you know, this is, this is really interesting. And I said, let's talk. And uh, for whatever the reason, maybe fundraising, maybe something else, I don't know, it just dropped. It just dropped. And I think that there are some members of the legislature who actually have to grow a backbone. Grow a backbone and realistically, 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 if you are from Cater August County and you're a Republican, you could have six heads and 12 arms, you're still gonna win, right? If you're a Democrat from the Bronx, six heads, four arms, you're gonna win. You're gonna win. So much of the politics, the fundraising, it is just crap. It is ridiculous because these people are gonna win no matter what. They're gonna win no matter what. It's based upon demographics, geographical location, things like that, and yet, and yet, they still want the money. They still want the money. And what do we see? Just the other day, another member of the assembly is going to jail. Um, because, you know, these, elections. Excuse me? Fair elections. We need fair elections. No, you need people to get out and vote. Nobody. It's not that the elections are not fair. Right. You need to get people out to vote. You've got to get people out to vote. Oh, well, that, that's good. But, you know, if you had enough people who were voting, the money wouldn't make that much difference. It wouldn't make that much difference. I don't think it would. Yes, sir. Has the governor or attorney general said a word? Are you kidding? About the uh, Are you word? kidding? Not a word. No. Are you kidding? Come on. I just got it. <laughs> <Come on. laughs> you know, I'm thinking about a song. You know the song? Dream on, man. Dream on. <laughs> yeah. Um, so and I've, and I've been sort of researching the law and we were discussing whether we want to push for abolition or jumping on board with some legislation for like reforming 58. I think you push for abolition and you take what you can get. Right. That was what we... Which is likely to be some sort of a compromise. That's what I would do. That's what I would do. Yes, sir. You had a, you had a comment or a question? No. question. I start trial tomorrow. Judge or the jury, they don't have. I can understand me. As a I don't really start child mind, just for the record. No. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, the jury doesn't even get to see it. No, the, the judge I would have the opportunity. Agree. The judge has the opportunity to require disclosure. But oh, he does. how many situations? go to a trial. How many situations go to a trial? You know, most of this stuff never sees the light of day. It can, it can, and part of 58 deals with exactly that situation where there is a judicial proceeding, the judge has the ability to review the materials in private to determine what should be admitted into evidence, what should be disclosed and what should not. So but it's not guaranteed that the judge It's not guaranteed, and that is separate and distinct from the request made by John or JQ Public under the Freedom of Information Law. Hmm. Yes? What is the underpinning of the Freedom of Information Law constitutionally? None. So that None. The Freedom of Information is, 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 is a legislative act. There's generally no constitutional right to government information. The only situation in which that exists involves your constitutional right to attend judicial proceedings. Beyond that, there is no constitutional right. For that matter, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Open Meetings Law. The Open Meetings Law gives the public the right to attend meetings of boards, committees, councils, uh, things like that. The City Council, the Town Board, the Village Board of Trustees, the Zoning Board, the Planning Board. Those are all meetings covered by the Open Meetings Law. That gives the public the right to be there. It says nothing at all about the public's right to speak during a meeting. And people have said, I have a constitutional right to speak. And I said, yeah, you do, but not here. Um, because the Open Meetings Law is statutory before it was passed. 
there was no general right to attend meetings of government, government bodies. There is now, and I said to people, you can stand on the steps of City Hall and talk to your heart's content, you can call a news conference, you can put up a website, a blog, whatever you want, but there is not necessarily a right to speak during the meeting. Yes, sir? So it sounds like what you're saying is that, um, so on the first of Gissing, then, you can explore on the 58th police officer personnel if now you proceed to trial, is that right? If it goes to trial and the judge looks at the records and says, yes, these records are relevant to the proceeding, so they're gonna come in. So if you have a history of Misconduct, you can explore that issue. Possibly. Oh, if there's a history that's different from the individual incident, that's part of the point. They don't want the history to be disclosed because that will color the views of the jury. This guy's been involved in 18 incidents of police brutality. Well, gee, he must be guilty this time, too. Uh, no, that, that probably would not come in. That probably would not come in. Even if 58 wasn't in place, the judge would still have oh, some judge authority in the case to say, hey, that there, goes for different There instances. are loads of situations in which records are available under the Freedom of Information Law, but they're not relevant to a judicial proceeding. And they could not be introduced into evidence during the proceeding because of that very so, reason. So, I mean, for, for, for people trying to, to understand what would happen if this law were to go away, we could explain to people, is that is that the case, though, that we our system has checks in place. Some of those checks are, are judges inside of it. Let me stop you. Um, there are lots of vehicles under which records are disclosed. The primary vehicle for members of the public is the Freedom of Information Law. And the Freedom of Information Law does not distinguish among people seeking records. You could be from Rochester or Timbuktu and have the same rights. And once the record is disclosed, you can do with it exactly as you see fit. You want to distribute it, you want to put it on your website, you want to tell the world, you want to give it to Fox News, that's up to you. That's entirely up to you. Um, and that happens all the time. That happens all the time. People use FOIL to acquire government records, and they can do with them as they see fit. As a matter of fact, you mentioned litigation. There's a case that dealt with uh, a person who had sued a New York City agency, and uh, he requested records from that agency under FOIL. And the agency said, well, wait a minute, you're a litigant, you can't use FOIL. The Court of Appeals unanimously said anybody can use FOIL. When you do, you are, as a member of the public, the fact that you're involved in litigation neither enhances nor diminishes whatever rights you've got as a member of the public. If you get it, anybody can get it. And in fact, one of the first critical decisions came out of the city of Rochester, Burr versus Udelson. I don't know if any of you remembers it. It's the any person principle. Um, the notion is that if a record is accessible under FOIL, it is equally available to any person without regard to one's status or interest. In contrast, when you're involved in a lawsuit, the, the key tool is called discovery. Discovery. And you get from your adversary what is relevant and material and necessary to the proceeding. Now that may be more than what you get under FOIL, but it may be less. It may be less. Because under FOIL, again, you get what the public gets. So there's a distinction between the two. There's a, a distinction between the two. Yeah. Does that help you at all? So I, I guess I'm, I'm thinking in terms of if somebody's worried, because it, it, it's, I get the sense that sometimes if people don't understand, or it's a, you know, like they see, oh, this law is in place, I don't really understand it, but it's probably there for a good reason. Something bad is going to happen if, if it goes away. I mean, in my in mind. 58? Yes. Nothing bad's going to happen if it goes away. <laughs> Believe me, nothing bad will happen. What will what, 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 what they let me, say? Let me make a point. Let me make a point. This is, this is what they argue about all the time. Somebody makes an accusation, anybody complain about us, you know, what do we do about that? Well, let's look at FOIL. Remember I talked about unwarranted invasions of personal privacy? You decide that I'm doing a lousy job. You decide that, you know, Freeman, Freeman's really doing bad things. You send a complaint to the Department of State. Nobody knows whether that complaint is true. Nobody knows whether it has merit. Disclosure at that point clearly would result in an unwarranted invasion of privacy. So if somebody sends a complaint about a cop and nobody knows whether it's true, it hasn't been substantiated, it hasn't been proven, it hasn't been admitted, 
That could be withheld. That could be withheld. That's the argument that I hear all the time. But what about complaints made against us? Anybody can make a complaint about anybody anytime. Yeah. Well, again, if it hasn't been proven or admitted, it is deniable under FOIL. That's why I say the repeal of 58 would not result in bad things. <coughs> FOIL still, still would authorize an agency to say no in that circumstance. What FOIL would open up is the record that indicates that yes, so and so has indeed engaged in this conduct. Yeah. So I'm, I'm just trying to cap on what you're saying. So a per people can make allegations, but if the allegations are not proven, yeah. then they're it withheld. It's all it could be withheld, right? Right? I send in a complaint to your boss and I say, you know, I hear so and so is doing bad things. Nobody knows whether it's true. Would it be fair to disclose that? To anybody, for any reason, of course not, right. of course not. And the same would be true right. with respect to the allegation, the complaint, the charge against the police officer or any public employee. It's out of bounds. You know this, working for the Board of Ed. When somebody initiates a charge under the education law, section 3028, can't have it, can't have it. It's only if the teacher has been found to engage in misconduct that it becomes public. Or if, and this is, this is ridiculous because it's so damn expensive, you know about 3028 proceedings, right? Are they cheap? No, they're not cheap, are they? Are they expensive? Yeah, and half the time you, res you get it into a settlement agreement, right? right? The settlement agreement is public as well, and it would be with respect to a police officer too. <clears throat> so like with the Benny Ward case, the- um, The who? The local- I don't live here. Okay. He has a brain. Uh, I don't know Disney, I don't. Uh, there were transcripts from the professional standards interviews that nope. were published. He was a, he's a police officer? He was a victim of police brutality. He's a right. victim of police brutality. Correct. Right. Or is he a, le a victim of alleged police brutality? No. Well, well I witnessed it. So it's you not witnessed alleged. it. Okay. <laughs> That's not alleged. Um, yeah, so there were professional standards complaints made and the transcripts were published. Now is that because his attorney released that information or is that a source that Probably. overturning 50A? Well, what was the outcome? It's so ongoing. It's well, ongoing. Well, the civil, the civil case is ongoing. Well, wait a minute. Let's talk about this because life becomes too complicated. <laughs> life becomes too complicated. FOIL does not apply to the courts but most court records are public. Right. So if somebody decides to initiate a lawsuit, whatever is submitted to the court by either party typically will become public. Typically it will become public. And the court record often is the treasure trove of material because there are very few limitations on access to court records. There are some, but not a lot. Some, but not a lot. So also in terms of defense, um, like criminal, so that's a civil situation, but in a criminal proceeding, even if it doesn't go to trial, I if mean, something is submitted Rochester to a court, ordinarily it becomes public. The only situation in which that would not be so, and everybody here ought to know this, if any one of us is charged with a crime and the charge is later dismissed in our favor, the records become sealed. Mm -hmm. It's almost like the unsubstantiated allegation. I'm arrested and the charge is dismissed because the cops arrested the wrong guy, the government couldn't meet its burden of proof, the idea is that that record, which involves a situation where there was no conviction, there was no finding of guilt on my part, shouldn't follow me around to my detriment for the rest of my life. Um, it's the same with the unsubstantiated allegation. Yeah. yeah but in that situation, if he chose to go proceed with the right claim against the police officer, would he weigh that as the sealing of his charges? Um, that's a situation where, again, the court would look at the record to determine what becomes public and what, what, we, what stays out. So I, I think something that we experienced and I've experienced and how I, I ran across this was that um, basically all our, our civilian review board relies on what our professional standards does. They, I mean, they, they, review boards are a crock. Let's face it, they're okay. a cross because they can't get anything. That's they can't true. do well, anything. That, 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 the fox is know. in the chicken coop. Why is that? Because the, because the, the unions will never negotiate a contract that will enable the, the, the civilian complaint review board to get it. 
That's the, that's the simple bottom line. And I know I'm being painfully direct, especially for a government employee. But you know, the truth is, the truth is you know, you reach retirement age, you can say whatever the hell you want. But I've been doing that for a long time anyway. So, you know, some people are used to it. But um, civilian complaint review boards, so what in so many instances, absolutely worthless in my opinion. In Albany, the civilian complaint review board has been trying to get stuff without identifying details for years. They can't even get that. They can't even get that. So um, look, the, the, the example that you gave about somebody making a complaint and it not being substantiated, the issue that we have here in Rochester is that when those complaints go into the internal affairs investigation, our civilian review board, our chief of police, they all make their decisions based on what that internal affairs investigation comes, comes up with. To, in my mind, all right, you've investigated at that point. Yeah, it's, it's no longer unsubstantiated um, claim. Why shouldn't that be public, public information? But covered under 58, that won't be released. And now, as citizens, we can't go and look at our civilian review board. We can't see how they make their decisions. We can't see how the chief of police makes his decisions because all that information is based on the internal affairs, and that's, and that's covered up. So <laughs> from, 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 that, from that perspective, I mean, at the point where the internal affairs has done the investigation, from a legal standpoint, should should we under FOIL be able to then access that information? Should you, or do you have the right to get it? Do we you should be right? able to get it, but you can't you right. because of 50A. Right. You can't because of 50A. You then have to leave that You can't because of 50A. Should you be able to? If a charge has been substantiated, so and so did something wrong, should be public in my opinion. Yes, Barbara. Um, I just want to ask if anybody didn't get a chance to sign the sign-in sheet, please. Yeah, sign-in sheet is really important. <laughs> <laughs> because before anybody else leaves, we are going to have strategy sessions. And if you didn't write down the strategy sessions, they're going to be on Tuesdays, next two Tuesdays, 7 o'clock at the Flying Squirrel, 125 Clarissa Street. 285. 285. 285 Clarissa Street. That's like Rocky and his friends. Yeah. That's, that's a whole thing. What about whistleblowers? Huh? What about whistleblowers? Well, where, well let's I mean, think about this. Forget about it. You know, let's take the, the, the most innocuous kind of whistleblower. You live over there, and there's a dog barking all the time down the street. You send a complaint to the police department. Are you leaving? I gotta run. Yeah, I feel completely <laughs> dissed. <laughs> <laughs> so busy. Feeble excuse. <laughs> um, you, you call the police department, you make a complaint. Cop comes to the door of the house where the dog is barking, says, somebody made a complaint about your dog. What's the next question? Who? Who? <laughs> Our advice has been that when you make a complaint, it doesn't matter who you are. And all the government really cares about is whether the complaint has merit. Okay. Is the dog really barking? For that reason, our advice has been that anything that identifies you, the complainant, can be withheld as an unwarranted invasion of personal yeah. privacy. So, so what can we do about 50A and how can we abolish it? How do we start a movement? How do we start a movement? This is the first Who's your assembly member? Kent? Janice, well, I think that you do your best to make your case to your elected representatives. And you know, you say there are, there are hundreds of us, thousands of us, who are upset, who are upset because most, most public employees are accountable, but there's an element of public employment that is not. And it happens to involve these people who are covered by 58 the civil rights law. You know, and then too, we had this incident involving Dana Moore with the correction officers. Mm -hmm. They're covered by 50A too. Gee, but they do everything right. You know, they, they <laughs> right? They, they don't, they don't, they don't, they don't, you know, they don't beat up prisoners, do they? They don't do things like that. No. Oh, the one in no, fish they kill. don't. Oh. And fish kill, yeah. I mean, you know, it's people who wear uniforms and it's the same thing. You know, we had a committee meeting, and who's there? It's the lobbyist for the correction officers. <laughs> oh, you know, these people put their lives on the line every day. You know, you don't want the job, don't take it. But if you do, that's the deal. That's the deal. That's the right. deal for all of us. That's the deal for all of us. <laughs> what about the case um, uh, where the judge is trying to get information about the, the officer who beat up Eric Garner, or who killed Eric Garner, sorry? Um, isn't there a case where the judge is trying to get 
that officer's records released? Mm, it's not the judge, it's the New York Civil Liberties Union. Oh, okay. It's the New York Civil Liberties Union. And the lower court, the Supreme Court, said, yep, the stuff should be public. But it's been appealed. It's been appealed. And when the government appeals, that puts a stay on the impact of the lower court decision. So even though it was Eric Garner, even though everybody knows that the cops strangled Eric Garner and that Eric Garner died, we still can't see the stuff. We still can't see the stuff based upon the argument that 50A continues to apply. So the appeal is going? The appeal is going to the appellate division now. Now. So 50A stops the subpoena? 50A stops disclosure in its tracks. 50A stops disclosure in its tracks. And again, due to the nature of our court system, you can go to court and you can win. The court will say, yes, this record should be disclosed. But if the government appeals, that stops disclosure right there. That stops disclosure right there. There's no disclosure until the next court says that it's public. And even then, there's a possibility that it could go to the state's highest court, unlikely, but it's possible. So disclosure could take years. Yes. But don't you think with the officers, they need a separation from the law and their promotion and, and job duties? What do you mean? They, because. Separation. That, what do you mean separation? A, a separation of the 50A law with the conduct of promotion and things like that. It's, they, they shouldn't include it in the 50A that says that you can't get this, the disclosure of this information because it's going to be detrimental to their, you know, being promoted or something. I mean, there, there, there should be a contingency, not a contingency, but a clause. I've heard so many shoulds tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so many shoulds. Yeah, yeah, you I think, think that think you're right. You your should is, I think I your should is on the mark. But I would say you would think that they would do something in that area. Didn't I say dream on before? <laughs> <laughs> Didn't I say dream on? You would think. You would hope. Mm -hmm. Yes. Are there any other groups in New York State that are, are that know actually, about this and working on this issue? Oh, there are a lot of groups that know about it. I don't know of anybody who's doing anything about it. You know, now who is here from the Civil Liberties Union? It's a, it's a sponsor. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 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 You know, are you an attorney? Yes. I'm not an attorney. You're not an attorney. Oh, Do you know what? Do you know what continuing legal education is? CLE. I did a CLE program for the New York City office of yeah, the uh, civil liberty. Uh, you saw it. Did you see it? It was it was it was a webcast or something like that. And um, they know all about 50A. They know all about 50A. My hope is that one of these days they will stand up and actually express themselves in a public way. We'll see whether that happens. But now that you're here, you've heard this. You have you have huge influence in New York City, don't you? Oh, I know. <laughs> use it, use it, use it. Yes. Um, we had the pleasure, I don't know if it was pleasure, but we had the, uh, um, the opportunity to have the police review board come to our group. Uh, Barbara, I don't know if you were there when they came. When they came yeah. and they we told had us both what, with pop, uh, professional standards section come and, and they, they were saying civilian review board also. right what they do with the officers and the officers hate them and everything they know about 50A yeah, right they sure do so I mean they, they said it at the end of that presentation they put it on the on the powerpoint oh, see they want to yeah they sure do it's a joke it is there's a, a woman in the back hi hi how are you it's just hey. peachy and you um what is or is there a weakness in the police union? Oh, I can't tell you that. <laughs> the police union may be different, you know, it has different power here than it does in New York City, oh, okay. than it does in Albany, than it does in, in Buffalo. Okay. You know, it's going to be different depending upon where you go. And, you know, you're talking about political influence as much as anything else, and it will differ from one situation to the next. The police union, it's not, it's not a monolith. There are police unions all over the state. We have a police union in my town. This is good. I'm glad because the next time the police report, the next time that board comes to us, I ask them about 50. Okay. Yeah. Why, why, why? Right? To see what they're going to say. See what they're going to say. They're going to act like they were so hard. You know, they're going to say, they're going to say. So we're going to take your case and we're going to do much. this. Come I mean, on. I mean, enough is enough to report on our CRV here. 
we're looking at like 10 plus years of annual reports from the CRB and PSS. And in the 12 years, you know, they sustained, the chief sustained only 2% of complaints. Joke. 2%, yeah. that's nothing. And then the worst punishment out of all of that. Did I use the phrase fox in the chicken coop before? <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. Did I say that? I think I did, yeah. I mean, and it's not just this mayor or this police chief, but this is 23 years of police chiefs and mayors. Yes. These are the same people that have worked in the system again and again and again. And they keep telling us, oh, it's fine, it's not broken. It's totally it's broken. It was built to be broken. Or built to work in their interest. But you know, it's broken, but you... 50A, you, how many people say, well, what about 50A? Nobody. I'm so glad you're all here tonight. This is amazing. Yeah, thank you. This is so cool. Thank you. Yes. Really so I can say, what about 50A? And let's see what happens. People still won't know what you're talking about. What you should stay and said instead, in my opinion, is what about police misconduct? What about police accountability? In, in my experience, um, and I did have a little bit of experience, uh, with this type of stuff here. Everybody keeps asking for a uh, civilian reboot, review board with um, subpoena power. Mm -hmm. Will that even make a difference? Would that make Does a difference? Does any civilian review Good board you know, have This is the way power? I would look at it. Good the civilian complaint review board would not be part of the police department. Mm -hmm. And my argument would be that when it gets the records, 58 doesn't apply to the civilian complaint review board. And there's a case law out of New York City where that conclusion was reached. That's been appealed to. Yeah. That's been appealed to. If that weren't appealed. If, if the Civilian Complaint Review Board is independent of the police department. Mm -hmm. If I get a record from the police department, I'm not covered by 50A. I'm not covered by 50A, I can disclose it. I can disclose it. And if a Civilian Complaint Review Board is independent of a police department, it could choose to disclose as well. Whether it would, that's another story. Depending on who's on it. Well, 50A might prevent them from getting that information to begin with. Well, that's a different question, right? Right. Yeah. Right? <coughs> right? Somebody said if they have subpoena power and they can get it, then what? Yeah. Well, I mean, it seems to me that if you were, for, say, 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 for example, the chief of police. Can you speak up a little bit? Say, for example, the chief of police is a policymaker, say, for example, the city charter of the city of Rochester, for example. Uh, one way to get around 58, 58 is to proceed in a judicial forum whereby you establish, like, say, for example, this is a particularly bad police officer, and there's been a, a series of means of which to track the police officer outside the construct of their control information. You could then bring those various people to establish well, a pattern of practice. So, but how do you get into court in the first place? You follow some work done. You follow the civil rights thing. Well, you know, if you can get it in that way, it becomes part of the court record. I don't think so be it. So be it. But most people are not going to initiate civil rights claims. It takes too much time. It costs too much money. And you know, in too many instances, the likelihood of success is relatively minimal. Right? And a civil rights claim, there might be a settlement, and part of the settlement agreement would be nobody's going to talk. Nobody's going to talk. I mean, that's what happens. That's what happens. Good night. Good night. I, feel, again, I feel completely, you know. Don't feel dissed, I've got grandkids. I so do I. <laughs> How many do you have? I have two. I have five. And Dr. Cohen says hello, by the way. Give him my best, <laughs> whoever he may be. <laughs> so, more. Give me more. Ask me anything. You'll never hear that from a state employee ever again. Yeah. <laughs> Ask me anything. Make my day. Come on. Is there hope? <laughs> is there hope? When there is life, there is hope. When there is life, there is hope. And the truth is, the truth is, I mentioned that the Committee on Open Government prepares an annual report. You know, sometimes we are banging our heads against the wall year after year after year after year. Then all of a sudden, a constituent gets in touch with a member of the legislature and says, you know, I have a problem with this. And they look at the report and they say, here is the solution. And there have been situations where proposals have been ignored for years. And then all of a sudden, they become law. So, yes, my belief is that where there is life, there is hope. If I wasn't hopeful, God knows, I would have walked a hell of a long time ago. Right? Right? You have to be optimistic. You have to be idealistic. Yes, it is Civil Liberties Union. Kayla. 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 Kayla.
What do you think about the legislators who hold the bill to reduce this last session in the Assembly and the Senate that uh, limit the scope of 58? Do you think they could be moved to introduce some legislation that would actually repeal it? Or do you think that's too You know, I think it's on? conceivable. I think it's conceivable for what it's worth. In the Senate, it's it's assembly. It's a Senator Dan Squadron <coughs> from Brooklyn, and in the Assembly, it's a guy named Dan Court, yeah. just as it sounds. Q U A R T. Mm -hmm. um, you know, realistically, if you're a Democrat in the Senate, you got you know it. You know it. You have to be a Republican in the Senate to get something through, unless the cast unless the leadership changes. In the Assembly, they might get something passed, but you know, if you have a Democrat s sponsoring it in the Senate. In so many instances, it's, it's the kiss of death. Well, basically that. Also it's a kiss of death. The okay. other uh, member who has introduced the bill is, is Senator Parker. Senator Parker from Brooklyn. Um, you know, again, he's a Democrat from Brooklyn. It's DOA. It's DOA. That's, that's the simple, nasty, honest truth. No, that's yes. That's why I feel that issue. It's why it's frustrating to figure out where you're going. Have you approached Danny O'Donnell? Danny O'Donnell is the assembly sponsor of the Parker bill. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, the cast of characters is relatively well known, but building the cast to the point where you might get some traction, it's exceedingly difficult. It's exceedingly difficult. Yeah. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the independent or uh, the investigator or the um, Cuomo, I, I thought, had a, uh, a special attorney for investigating um, issues of uh, police, police misconduct. Um, the, uh, I, I believe that you're referring to an executive order that was recently issued that enables the Attorney General to investigate situations where there has been a death as a result of yes. action taken by police. Mm -hmm. you, uh, I mean, from your, your experience around Albany, do you have any, uh, any feeling or in, in terms of optimism in terms regarding how much that might might change the way things uh, pan out here in this, this I state. think that it, it does, I think, how do I put this nicely, it's only did it. It just doesn't. You think the Attorney General is more trustworthy than the DA in Albany County? Probably not. Probably not, and the DA in Albany County has criticized the executive order because it has, it has holes in it. Um, you know, his comment was that it's purely political. Um, and, hmm. and I am a member of the administration, but you know, in consideration of what this administration does, it's probably right. So it could easily fall under the, the umbrella of something that's done to, to look good, but maybe not really accomplish much of anything that would be... Huh. How well do you know this governor? <laughs> <laughs> huh. Huh. And I serve it as pleasure. <laughs> I do. And I think, to be honest with you, not to overstate this, I think I'm the only person left in the executive branch who can pick up the phone just because it rings and talk to you or the New York Times or the DNC or whoever it might be. And it is an incredible luxury. It is an incredible luxury. And I believe that there are a couple of reasons for that. Number one, uh, the governor rec remembers that I worked for his father when his father was Secretary of State a thousand years ago. Okay. His father was a lawyer above all, and if he thought that I was right on the law, he was completely supportive. Okay. That's number one. Number two, fear of the news media. Okay. Fear of the news media, you know, if there were an effort to silence uh, me or my office, all it would take is one phone call. Okay. Fifty editorials within two days, I could guarantee it. I could guarantee it. Hmm. In fact, I, I, I was... I was um, <laughs> I was honored here at one of the hotels down the street. <laughs> I got a call from the uh, editor of the DNC, and she said, um, we're giving you, this is the Associated Press Managing Editors Association, you're giving you a Lifetime Achievement Award. And my thought was, am I dying? <laughs> Those are the awards you get before you die. But uh, it was a couple of years ago, and I'm still here. Um, yeah, and you know, um, that was 50 reporters in the room, and I said the same thing. Ask me anything, ask me anything. And uh, I, I feel that the news media as an industry is an ally. It's an ally, and it enables us to be independent. Yeah? Yes, now, say for example, if I made a request to a, to a local agency here, city agency, New York. Now, if they're required generally to provide you with a copy of the FOIA request, is that satisfactory? Are FOIA requests themselves public? Is for that example, what you're asking? If I wrote a letter to the mayor of the city of Rochester, yeah. I requested a particular commission, 
And she, for example, she was a final person in terms of review of the FOIA request. Is she required to provide you a copy of the denial or? The provide me? Yeah, you're off. No, open, no, I mean, you're open, no. Open. First of all, just to give you some perspective, every government agency is required to designate a so-called records access officer. Um, if uh, you make a request and it's denied, you have the right to appeal. Right. And the appeal goes to the head of the agency yeah. or somebody designated by the head of the agency. Hardly ever is it going to be the mayor. It probably will be the mayor's attorney, the corporation counsel, mm -hmm. or somebody like that. If there is an appeal, yes, a copy of the appeal and the determination of the appeal are supposed to be sent to our office. When you say appeal, you're saying appeal of the executive? Appeal of the final denial of okay. your request. Is your, your, your office is a copy of that? We're supposed to get a copy, yes. Everyone, every time? Say, every time okay. somebody's denied okay. and appeals and there's a decision and following the appeal that's supposed to come to our office. Copy from your office can you get it? No, say, for example, a copy of what she sent you. Yeah, that's probably. Okay. Yeah, that's probably. Sure. Yeah. Are there any special laws that govern when you were saying you're the one that, you're one of you that can still pick up the phone? Yeah. That's situation? not because there's a law. Are there well I was just wondering, are there any are there any laws that govern communications between elected officials and the administrations that they work with? Sure. Freedom so, of information law. They would be so called intra agency materials. Those internal governmental communications. You've heard the phrase interagency and intra-agency material. Thank you. Maybe you have, maybe yeah. you have. No, no, I have. I, I, I'm, that's not exactly what I was saying. What are you thinking? At. I'm talking about, so we have a protocol in the, in the school district yeah. of how board members access information from yeah. our administration. Yeah. And it's a very controlling protocol. How could it be and that you have lesser access than John or Jane Q. Public? Is that accurate? Is that is that the way it works? There is an onerous process to get information. What do you have to do? You have, so as a school board member, I want to find out um, how many students on the day before school were told not to show up to school the first day because they, the schools were over and old. Well, let's stop for a minute. If it's a FOIL request, FOIL pertains to existing records. No, but I shouldn't have to. They shouldn't require a FOIL request. They can. They can. Right. And, and trust me, school board members have often said, I will foil this. Okay. You know, as part of um, okay, but, effort. Okay, but, but, but you'd, be, you'd be barking up the wrong tree with that last one. Because I guarantee you, there's no record that would indicate the number. And they don't have to create one for you. Right, so that's why I said my question was about communications, governing communications between elected officials and the administrations that they're working with. Are there special rules or provisions? Not that I, not, not that I know of. Not that I know of. There may be something somewhere in a city charter Did that or something like that. Did that happen? You know what it's about? You know what it's about? What? It's all about control. Exactly. It's all about exactly. control. Sure and in so school long. districts, in school districts, you know, there are some superintendents, not all, who love control more than anything else. And their dream is to have a board that consists of members who are uniformly deaf, dumb, and blind. That way they could just do whatever, whatever the hell they want. They you know that control. that's true, right? You know that that's right. I don't know that's right. You know that it's right. Mm -hmm. Superintendents get paid any money? Do they get paid a lot of money? Yeah. yeah. Six How about their attorneys? That. Do they get paid a lot of money? Yeah. They get paid ridiculous amounts of money. And they want to hold on to their jobs. So what do they do? Too often, too <coughs> often, they give their clients the answers that they think their clients want to hear. Sometimes they're right. Sometimes they are not. Catherine, you had a question? I do. Hello, Catherine. It's a little bit of a naive question. A naive you said question. You could put out, should your job be threatened? Yeah. A, a phone call and you'd have yeah. 50 Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you do that when you released this annual report calling for the Oh, we send it to every member of the state legislature. We send it out to the news media. We give it to Diane Kennedy. We, you know, Diane Kennedy is the president of the News Publishers Association. She was one of those reporters who would call me at 9 o'clock at home. You know, when she was a, a, a kid reporter. Um, she's the call that I would make if need be. But yeah, we do that. We do that, but we can't force newspapers to write editorials about 58 of the civil rights law. Some have. Some have. New York Times did. I don't know if the DNC did. Albany Times Union did. Other papers did as well. Um, but getting the state legislature to do anything? Pulling teeth. It's like pulling teeth. Is interacting with our 
is interacting with like our, our local media is something that we should we should be taking like a, a higher role and should we be engaging our editors and saying hey this is a really big issue Why i think you say uh, hey we're uh, we're going to be meeting with uh, assemblyman and senator so-and-so to discuss this issue thought you might want to know about it <clears throat> so then they'll pick up the phone and they'll call senator so-and-so or whomever and you know you shift the burden you impose pressure upon the people who have the ability that's sometimes to that's act. That's pretty helpful. I mean, as, as someone who, <coughs> who engages the media more often, I mean, it's kind of a perspective that I never would have <laughs> never would have thought about. I think, oh, I just go to my assembly person. But I mean, what are I mean? I think that's maybe something you call Rachel see. Barnhart and say, I'm going to get in touch with Assemblyman so and so, and we're going to talk about such and such. And besides that, Freeman said that I ought to do this. <laughs> and, you know, and she'll say, oh, well, maybe I'll too. maybe I'll call him. And you know, I mean, that's the way it works. There are so many instances in which members of the news media call knowing the answer. They can't print their own opinions. They call me for the quote. I have no hesitation about giving it. I'm going to call a guy from Indy Media. Huh? I'm going to call a guy from Indy Media. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll quote directly. I don't, okay. I don't, you know, you know, Indy Media? Yeah. You don't want Indy Media. You want Channel 8. You want Channel This. You want, cha you know, Sorry, you want the ones who reach the most You want the ones who reach the most people. Right. You can edit that out, right? No, 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 I'll keep that in. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It's good PR. But Indy okay. Media is the one who provides the direct transcript of the police brutality case. Yeah, but how many people read Indy Media? How many people, how many people, how many people, you know, um, are, are not, don't have preconceived notions who read Indy Media? Hmm. It's a different purpose. I mean, it's all leftist. I love when right? the DNC quotes <laughs> articles that right. Excuse verbatim, me? Though, that's always fun. What? Well, the DNC quotes me verbatim. Great. Yeah. Great. It's, because it still has more circulation than the others. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Hmm. All right. Well, thank you.